Troy Kickler has been with the Locke Foundation for about a decade or so. He's the founding director of the North Carolina History Project. He holds an MS from North Carolina A&T State and a PhD from the University of Tennessee. He has taught at the secondary and post-secondary levels, including over at NC State. So he, all, he edits NorthCarolinaHistory.org. If you haven't logged on to that, I hope you will. He's also involved in numerous workshops, and he is an author. Now, currently, he is co-editing something called North Carolina Founders, a re-examination, but you may have seen this book. He is the author of this book that was published, Troy, was it last year that this was published? December 2013. There you go. It's called The King's Troublemakers. I love that title. I've teased him about it many times. Edenton's Role in Creating a Nation and State. If you haven't checked out this book, it's, it's very interesting. Not only historical information, but it's rather entertaining, particularly about when you read about the role of women in uh, political history in North Carolina. Today, though, Troy is going to be talking to us about um, this whole idea of North Carolina as a battleground state in politics. We hear that all the time. It is true. Uh, some of us may think that that is a new phenomenon. It actually is not. Troy is going to be telling us why not. He's going to be talking about things such as the Regulator Rebellion, North Carolina's status in national debates, including the 1787 Constitutional Convention, the ratification debates, and many, many more items. With that, I give you Dr. Troy Kickler. Is that good, Mitch? Is that fine? Everybody can hear me? Okay. All right. Yes, I'll be talking about North Carolina as a battleground state, even uh, put my notes in a purple folder so, uh, um, <clears throat> so I can make sure that I, I stay on track with my uh, thesis there. Uh, you know, if, if past decade or two, been reading the news, people refer to uh, North Carolina as a purple state. Will it vote red? Will it vote blue? Will the election results be red? Will it be blue? Uh, they refer to it as a battleground state. But, you know, if you read Ecclesiastes 1.9, uh, it says there's nothing new under the sun. And so you can look in North Carolina's past and you can see where it was a battleground state uh, on the national scene. Or it was a very important state in a particular debate. And sometimes it was literally a battleground state. North Carolinians picked up guns, met on a field, and settled their political differences. Uh, sometimes they did that in mass. Sometimes they did that individually in duels until they were outlawed in North Carolina in 1802. So if you wanted to have a duel, you would just travel up, up to Virginia and uh, you would uh, have, have a duel there. Uh, <clears throat> so there are four uh, periods in North Carolina's past I want to talk about today. Three are from the founding era. And one is approximately six to ten years before uh, the American Re Revolution. And those four are the Regulator Rebellion, which occurred uh, six to ten years before the American Revolution started. Uh, the American Revolution, North Carolina and the American Revolution. Uh, North Carolina's role in the Connecticut Compromise, the Great Compromise of the Constitutional Convention in 1787. And then North Carolina's role in helping um, um, secure a Bill of Rights, helping make sure that that important addendum was added to the U.S. Con Constitution. Now each, this is a lot of in information. Uh, and so I will give you a cursory look at that, and hopefully uh, there will be enough time for a, a lengthy uh, Q&A. And within each of these four categories, there could be several lectures in and of themselves. So I'll try to do my best to stay uh, focused and uh, not get off on too many rabbit trails, as a middle school teacher of mine used to say a lot of times. So let, let me just start off by saying, why study North Carolina history? Well, you can say state history is important. That's the most obvious answer. A second reason is as more and more people are moving into North, North Carolina, it offers an opportunity to t tell certain stories to folks and to make sure that these uh, stories um, are, are told and that people are made aware of North Carolina's role in uh, the American founding, for, for instance. And also, I would argue, the study of North Carolina history or the study of any state's history reminds us of, of, of the federal underpinnings 
of the American gov gov government. The very act of doing that, whether one realizes it or not, they are reminded that there's something in between the individual and the nation state. And that, are, that is the 50 states of the United States of, 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 of America. And then uh, there are debates about um, whether there's going to be changes made to history curriculum in this state uh, across the nation. Whether that happens or not, there will always be um, people here at the Lott Foundation studying North Carolina history, making sure that certain stories are told, certain questions are being asked of our states and our nation's past. Well, before these four uh, eras that I mentioned, there had been di disagreements between Nor North Car Carolinians before that. There's actually a long history of this, and one of them is the Cary Re Rebellion. Not the namesake of the town, but it was another Cary, uh, Th Thomas Cary, who lived out in the Ob Albemarle Sound, northeastern North Carolina. And uh, make a long story short, um, he didn't like Quaker dissidents, and he didn't, want, he didn't want them to hold public office. But in time, he realized that he needed to make political alliances with these dissidents. Well, that put, then put him at odds with the royal governor, or the governor at, at the time. So. 150 men were sent out to capture Thomas Carey. He, he uh, returned the favor by sending a small boat into the Albemarle, Albemarle Sound to try to capture the governor. Imagine that. Okay? He is, if you don't know where the Albemarle Sound is, it's uh, this area right here. Yeah, that area. So, he was arrested. He's taken back to England to be held trial in front of the eight Lords Proprietors, the eight men who owned North Carolina and South Carolina. Nothing happened for a year. Nobody came to pro prosecute. So he returned back to North, North Carolina and lived a relatively peaceful life after all that drama, uh, if you can imagine that. Another one that occurred, and this is linked to the Regulator Rebellion that I will talk about, is the Enfield Riots. There were protests that occurred in Granville County, Edgecombe Counties, and Halifax County. There were allegations of corrupt land agents. You see, at the time, the north, northern half of North Carolina was owned by Lord Granville and his descendants. The land office was in Edenton, North, North Carolina. So like when the Moravians came to North Carolina, they wanted to purchase land, around the Winston-Salem area, they had to travel all the way out east and meet with the land agents out there. Well, there were allegations of corrupt land agents. People wanted more transparency with the books. They thought uh, people were cooking the books a little bit, so they wanted more transparency. So, property owners, and these were prominent men in North Carolina, kidnapped the land agents, took them to Enfield, which is in Halifax County, held them there for four days, and under du duress, the land agents uh, opened up their books uh, to uh, the, the property owners. And so this type of sentiment, uh, thinking that there might be corruption in government, leads us to the Regulator Rebellion, which occurred basically 1768 to 1771, although there were antecedents before that. And as I said before, sometimes North Carolinians actually met on a battlefield to settle their disagreements. Well, there have been some distrust of government, as I've uh, relayed to you already. But in the Regulator Rebellion, it pitted mainly Piedmont farmers against landed interests and the royal government in, in the East. And what is interesting about this is some who sided with the, or who opposed the regulators, eventually became some of the founding fathers of the United States of America. Well, what were the regulators' complaints? Well, they said there were excessive le legal fees. They believed there was collusion between sheriffs and attorneys. Um, um, they couldn't pay their taxes on their property, so their land, land would be seized. Therefore, they couldn't uh, make a li living, and then they would owe more money. It was just this vicious uh, cycle. And they believed that the royal government spent money excessively. And their one particular complaint was the uh, building of Tryon Palace, the construction of Tryon Palace in New Bern. What's there now is a, a, a replica of it because the original burned down. Um, uh, but they complained about the construction of Tryon Palace. They thought it was too or ornate. It was ostentatious. Remember, many of them lived in one or many regulators, Piedmont farmers lived in one or two bedroom homes. Not bedroom, but rooms. One or two rooms. 
Uh, so they complained that Tryon Palace was too ostentatious. And, and guess what? The building of Tryon Palace actually cost more than what the estimate said it was going to cost. <laughs> and so they had a, um, a complaint about that. There was also a cultural component to this, or religious differences, denominational differences, if you will. Many of those in the Piedmont were of uh, um, new, new lights, low church, if you will, Baptists, Methodists, Quakers. Many who opposed the re regulation were from the A Anglican church. I mean, if you go to New, new Bern today in the Episcopal church, uh, if you go in there, there's a, a chalice donated to the church from King, King George III. And there's offering plates um, and so forth. So there was these, uh, these cultural, religious di differences as well. And you read the sermons. Like there's an Anglican minister, George M M Micklejohn, who says that you need to obey those in authority. He's saying that from the pulpit. He's saying what you're doing is unscriptural, telling the reg regulators that are people who subscribe to regulators' beliefs. You have regulators like the Quaker Herman Husband who writes a tract and says that uh, the government needs to stay within its prescribed bound boundaries and not encroach on individuals' liberty. He's more than likely saying that from the pulpit. He's definitely saying it in print in this essay that's being published and, and spread widely throughout the colony. Then you have these outreach efforts in, into the Piedmont. Anglican missionary Charles Wood Mason, who was from the propagation of the Society for the Propagation of, of the Gospel, and it has an even longer name, but that's the first part of it that I remember. He traveled, he claimed, approximately 6,000 miles. And he, is, is, he was alarmed at the splintering among the Protestant denominations in, in, in the Piedmont. He thought that that led to chaos and possibly anarchy. And then he was shocked at uh, some of the behaviors in the Piedmont. He, he complained of the swearing in the Piedmont. He said there are few parts in the world that could compete with the Piedmont in swearing. One of his sermons is entitled this. The title of the sermon should tell you what might have been happening on a Sunday in the Piedmont. The title of the sermon was, Bring No Dogs With You. <laughs> well, this is all the background. Well, you have some of the, the regulators in the Piedmont who believe that the royal government has overstepped its boundaries and the Sandy Creek Association is formed. And that is basically a, a, a Baptist association that championed liberty and wanted government to perform legitimate functions. The sheriff, Edmund Fanning, a notorious figure, considered that association tre treasonous, so it was uh, di disbanded. Well, things are building, and the re regulators meet in Hillsborough, which was a very important town at the time, they, at the courthouse, they demanded attention uh, to, to their complaints. They wanted to be jurors on the court. In particular, they targeted Sheriff Edmund Fanning because they believed he was a corrupt official. They made an effigy of him. They ran him out of town. They burned a bell donated by him to, to the lo local church, and then they targeted his house. They also targeted the judge who had the name Richard Henderson. Uh, they targeted uh, the judge and ran him out, out of town. Now notice that these, they were called the Hillsborough Riots, but they were tar targeted actions. They were targeting certain in, in individuals. Well, this is building, this is building. The assembly passes the riot bill. You've heard that phrase, do I have to read the Riot Act or something like that? Well, they passed the, the Riot Bill. Basically said if 10 or more people are assembled, it is an unlawful assembly if they, are not dis if they do not dismiss after the Riot Bill has, has been read. One of the leading proponents of the Riot Bill of 1770 was Samuel Johnston, who was one of North Carolina's first United States Senators. He was the sixth governor of the state and he was a member of the Continental Congress. Well, things are building and building. 1771, approximately 2,000 Piedmont farmers with hardly any weapons at all, some actually carry like pitchforks, with hardly any weapons at all, met approximately 800 militia on a field in Alamance. And the Battle of Alamance ensued and lasted for approximately two hours. When the smoke cleared, 
The guns stopped, the smoke cleared, uh, the farmers had fled, and the militia and Royal Governor Tryon had settled that political dispute. But example had to be set. Twelve regulators were captured. Six were hanged. And uh, they were hanged by a busy roads. So it would be like if you're going down I-40 and you see these decomposing, swinging bodies from a tree. That, they were making a point. But yet they also set six rate regulators free. And that was also making a point, saying we do have, have compassion. <laughs> we are letting these six free, but there needs to be justice from the royal government's viewpoint. And then, lo and behold, if you can believe it or not, thousands were taking an oath of allegiance in, in the Piedmont in the subsequent weeks. The second category that I want to talk about is North Carolina's role in the Re Revolutionary War. Some people have argued, some scholars have argued, that the Revolutionary War in North Carolina was essentially a civil war among North Carolinians who obviously had different political differences or opinions. Now, you had the Loyalists or the Tories on one side who supported the Crown. You had the Patriots, a.k.a. the Whigs, who uh, uh, were uh, for the, the, the American cause. And the war actually started, or the conflict, if you will, actually started in North Carolina before the Revolutionary War started. Does anybody know where? Actual clash. Yes, sir. My bookshelves are groaning. I need to. Okay. Yep. At the Battle of Moore's Creek, which occurred on February 27th, 1776. So that's before the Halifax Resolves. That's before the U.S. Declaration of Independence. There, loyalists, North Carolina loyalists, met North Carolina pa patriots. And it was a brief battle. But the Patriots, uh, at the end of the day, so to speak, as, or as they say, Patriots captured many men, equipment, and money. Things were getting tough for Loyalists in North Carolina, so many left for friendlier environments. They went to Canada, or they went to other uh, colonies. Well, while they were gone, sometimes their property was seized. The North Carolina Assembly had passed conf confiscation acts, and we'll get to that in um, a second. Again, all this is very brief history of, of a lot of information here. And if you have questions, I'll try to do my best to answer them when I wrap, wrap it up. Uh, David Fanning started what was called the Tory War. And if you go to uh, Park House in the Horseshoe, uh, outside of Sanford, in between Sanford and Asheboro and Moore County there, you can see where one skirmish in that Tory War took place. By the way, that's a great place to go for a picnic uh, as well. It, it's, it, the deep river goes around it like, uh, like, 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 like a horseshoe. Imagine that. So also another famous in incident between North Carolinians is the Battle of Kings Mountain or the Over Mountain Men Trail. About 1,800 men from Tennessee and western North Carolina. Keep in mind, Tennessee was part of North Carolina at the time. It was part, part of the state. It hadn't become a state yet. But from the, what we now call Tennessee and Western North Carolina, traveled to Kings Mountain. And they fought a lot of loyal, they fought loyalists there, many of them uh, from North, North Carolina. And one historian has said this, quote, more than any other battle, Kings Mountain reflects the passion and differences among revolutionary era Americans. Why would that historian make that claim? Because except for a few high officials in the British Army, every man there was an American. Every man at the Battle of Kings, except for a couple higher officials on the British side, was an American. You have the Battle of Hall River, which uh, near Bur Burlington pitted North Carolinians against North, North Carolinians. You have the Battle of Ramsar's Mill, which pitted North Carolinians against North Carolinians. Um, and Nathaniel Green is leading his campaign, and that ends, well, it doesn't end, but there's a significant battle in Greensboro well, what is now Greensboro, and that is the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. It was a Pyrrhic victory for Cornwallis. He claimed, he, he claimed the field, and, and that's how people define victory 100, 200 years ago. Who won the battle? Well, it's who claimed the field at the end, end, end of the day. 
But Cornwallis's men never recovered uh, from that battle. Morale was low. Uh, there were so many casualties to Cornwallis's army that if it was a victory, it was a Pyrrhic victory for him and his men. There's another incident in the Revolutionary War, or, or the aftermath of the Revolutionary War, that's very important. North Carolina plays a key role in this concept. Remember those, uh, the land, the property that was seized because of the Confiscation Acts? There was a daughter of a loyalist who wanted to uh, um, get the land. Uh, so there, there was a trial. She didn't get it, the land. And, but in the process of the trial, the court overruled a state legislative act and said the trial should, should proceed. She should have a trial. The, the legislation said she shouldn't, but the court overruled that, and that set a legal precedent for what? Anybody know? All right, you get a book. <laughs> and they're autographed, too. <laughs> These are books from uh, former speakers of the Hi History Project. So that set a legal precedent for Marbury versus Madison, 1803, which at the national level is the idea of judicial re review. One neat fact, or we'll call it a rabbit trail, if you will. Um, I told you that North Carolina, South Carolina was owned by the Lord's pr proprietors. Eight men who were rewarded for their political allegiances to King Charles II during the, or helping him, uh, you know, the, the crown to be restored to England or Charles II. So he awarded them land and that's the tracks in North Carolina and South Carolina. Well, early 1700s, seven of them sold their land back to the crown of England, except for Lord Granville's descendants. That's the northern half of North Carolina. So when the Revolutionary War occurred, the northern half of North Carolina was owned by Lord Granville's descendants. Well, they, there was a case in the early 1800s where they tried to get their land back. Um, and paperwork just sat on desks. It didn't go anywhere. So imagine that. <coughs> <coughs> so over a period of time, it was dismissed. So, um, all right. Let's talk about the Connecticut Compromise, which a Connecticut Compromise is a synonym for another label that typically civic students learn in their classrooms. The Connecticut Connecticut Compromise is also known as what? I've got to give away another book. <laughs> something's not, something's fantastic, it's wonderful, it's also, you, yes, the Great Compromise, yes. <laughs> All right, the Great Compromise or Connecticut Compromise, what was North Carolina's role in that? Well, America's first constitution was the Articles of Confederation. Many believed that the Articles of Confederation was too weak. For instance, the national government did not have the authority uh, to tax. There was no standing army, no general army. There were some Americans who believed that those two things, for instance, should, uh, the national government should have the authority uh, to do. So some wanted to revise the Articles of Confederation. Some wanted to scrap the Articles of Confederation entirely, make a long story and fascinating story short, delegates met at the Annapolis Convention in 1785 and said, we need to have a convention to form a new document, a new governing document for the United States of America. Our delegate, Hugh Williamson, was late. So when they made their decision, he's kind of riding up in the parking lot. Um, and and they've, they've already decided they're going to meet in Philadelphia in 1787. So, Delegations meet in Philadelphia in 1787 to talk about uh, this new document, this new governing document of the United States of America, the document that we call the U.S. Constitution. Keep in mind, Constitution is a general, broad term. There are many constitutions. Some churches have constitutions. Corporations have constitutions. I said the Articles of Confederation was our first constitution. Our constitution just happens to be called the Constitution, and there's no uh, other name. Uh, well, the United States con con Constitution. So it, it's a subcategory of a broader category is what I'm trying to say. Well, there was a heated political debate occurred in Philadelphia in that hot summer of 1787. 
Many people make the mistake thinking that the founders were arm in arm swaying singing campfire songs. But they had disagreements. There were political enemies. All you have to do is, is read about the 1800 election when Thomas Jefferson was elected, the dirt that was uh, in that campaign. Uh, and so you have uh, um, behind, you know, behind the scenes deals that are being made as, as well. But the point is, there was heated debate in Philadelphia, and, there, and the Great Compromise, or the Connecticut Compromise, was a result of much deliberation and political man, man, maneuvering. People were thinking about, how often should there be, be elections? Where should the power be placed? Should the power to tax be placed in the executive branch? Should it be placed in the legislative branch? Where will all these powers be, be placed? Um, not only in the branches, but what about state governments and nas national government? Who's, you know, how are we going to define sovereignty, for instance? And so many founders used pen names. Their pen names are like Marcus, uh, Publicola. You can tell they were influenced by the, the Romans. Uh, so they're using pseudonyms, they're writing essays, trying to influence public, public opinion. Well, there were two ideas about representation. Now, the Great Compromise involves a lot of uh, things, the economy, uh, slavery, uh, tariffs. It involves a lot of things. But representation is a key component of it. There's the Virginia plan which proponents said that the legislative branch should be based on population and there should be two le legislatures in the national government. Opponents said, well, this favors the states that have the most people. Small states didn't like that plan. You had the New Jersey plan, which called for a unicameral, one legislature, and equal representation in all states. Each state had the same number of votes. Well, this sounded all too familiar for proponents of the Virginia plan to the Articles of Confederation. So they were against it. They were at an impasse, if, if you will. Will the small states go home and the Constitutional Convention will never uh, result in anything? North Carolina had an important role in this. North Carolina was a big state, geographically speaking, but in many ways it had small state in interest because it didn't have the types of economies that uh, of, of, of Virginia had, uh, for instance. So, the man who was late to the Annapolis Convention played a very important role, Hugh w Williamson. A Renaissance man, he was a med med medical doctor. He wrote about um, uh, the climate change in 1770. There, there, there's a pamphlet that he wrote to the American Philosophical Society. Um, again, nothing's new un un under the sun. People have been talking about that for 500 years. Uh, it's just what causes it is the... Uh, is the question, but people have noticed it. It's just they ask, they disagree on what causes it. But Hugh Williamson spoke 70 times at the Constitutional Convention. Some said nobody talked so much as Hugh Williamson and accomplished so little. <laughs> However, if you look at the Constitution, uh, the uh, impeachment process was introduced by Hugh w Williamson. The idea that U.S. Senators have six-year terms was introduced by Hugh Williamson. Yes, that was a big disagreement. Some people believe a senator should serve for life. Some believe a president should serve, should ha have a life term. So people were disagreeing about that, but Hugh Williamson was a key player. He convinced the North Carolina de de delegation to vote for the Great Con Compromise, the Congress as we know it today, with one house based on population, the other house with states getting the same number of votes. Previously, Hugh Williamson was for the, the Virginia plan, but John Rutledge of South Carolina uh, persuaded Hugh Williamson uh, to vote for the Great Com Compromise. And the esteemed his historian of North Carolina, who unfortunately is no longer with us, William Powell, has said this, North Carolina's vote contributed toward keeping the convention in session as the small delegates might have left if their calls had been lost. So Hugh Williamson, and I would argue, did accomplish a lot at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. One last thing is North Carolina's role in securing a Bill of Rights. North Carolina, I argued, had an important role. Not an exclusive role, but a very important role. After uh, uh, um, the 55 delegates at the Constitutional Convention agreed 
on the document, a draft, it was submitted to the various uh, uh, state ratification conventions to be approved. If you look at Article 7 of the Constitution, it says when nine states approve of the Constitution, it takes effect. Essentially, that's what it says, or the new union is formed. Well, nine states approved it rather quick, quickly, some by a unanimous vote. Some were divided, like Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and South Carolina, but they ratified, they approved the U.S. Con Constitution. However, there are four states that were undecided. New, New York, Rhode Island, Virginia, and North, North Carolina. So people who are for the Constitution are trying to persuade delegates at these various ratification conventions to approve the Constitution. And initially, the Federalist Papers, probably the best commentary on the U.S. Constitution, was written to try to convince New Yorkers to ratify the U.S. Constitution. Well, there are people writing essays in these other states as well, but the Federalist Papers has come down as the most famous. Well, there is a heated debate occurring in North Carolina after the document has been submitted to the state to, to ratify. So there were two ratification conventions in North Carolina, one in Hillsboro in 1788 and one in Fayetteville in 1789. North Carolina is the only state in which this happened. In 1788, North Carolina refused, people say refused to ratify. That's not completely accurate. They refused neither to ratify or reject. We're just going to sit back and see what happens. Here. So they didn't approve the U.S. Constitution. So wrap your mind around this. For one year, North Carolina is essentially out of the American Union. Although it still trades with, uh, the, United, with the United States. Um, uh, uh, there, Hugh Williamson is like a, a delegate to, to the co Congress to keep North Carolina informed. People anticipated North Carolina joining, uh, ratifying the, the U.S. Constitution. But North Carolina had a particular concern. Many of there were leading federals, federalists in the state, capital F federalists, who wanted North Carolinians to approve the Constitution, but much of the populace, the population, was of an anti-federalist sentiment. There was something missing from the U.S. Constitution that was very, very important to them, and that is a Declaration of Rights. Every state constitution had one. Why is the national constitution? Why is that omitted from the national con constitution? Well, there were Federalists who said it, it's not needed in the National Constitution because the powers that be, what is it, Article 1, Section 8, the powers are, that are given to the national government are enumerated in that. A Bill of Rights is not needed. If, you, if we start including a bi bill, bill of Rights, then what happens if we forget one? Does that mean the national government has the authority to intervene in individuals' lives that way? But then the counter-argument is, Every state constitution has a Declaration of Rights, whether it's a preface, it's in the Constitution itself, or it, it's an addendum to it. Every state constitution has a de Declaration of Rights. Why should this one be no different? And keep in mind, the memories of the Revolution are fresh in, in, in their mind as well. They want something in writing guaranteeing certain individual rights will not be uh, encroached. So. The leading Federalists in North Carolina were James I Iredell, one of the uh, first justices on the U.S. Supreme Court. When all this is over with, George Washington nominates him to the U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, he's uh, approved, the Senate approved. William Davey was a leading fe Federalist. He was a leading public figure in North Carolina, a, a, a leader in the university system at the time. Who were the leading anti-Federalists? Wiley Jones was a leading anti-federalist. Uh, um, who do you know who was the mouthpiece of the anti-federalists at the ratification convention? Wiley Jones didn't say much, but Thomas Person. Thomas Person? So I, but there, there was a superior court judge who said quite, quite a bit. Samuel Spencer. For sake of time, I've got to keep going on. Samuel Spencer. He talks a lot in the, uh, uh, at the ratification convention, but Wiley Jones is considered the mastermind. Uh, Jones Street is named after him, where the legislature meets. Uh, one of the first things that Wiley Jones said at the ratification convention is, uh, well, let me back up. Iredell was a great orator. 
he, wanted, he considered this an opportunity to explain what the Constitution means, this, this convention. So he wanted to talk. He was a good orator. Wiley Jones knew that. He didn't want to give him the opportunity to talk. So one of the first things that Wiley Jones said, by the way, Jones Street is named after Wiley Jones. One of the first things that Wiley Jones said is like, you know what? We've all been given copies of the Constitution. We've read it. We know what we're going to do. Let's save the taxpayers some money and just vote on it and go home. That's what Wiley Jones said. But then Ira Dell uh, did not like that. So long story short, Ira Dell had the opportunity to provide commentary. Anther strategy was that anti-federalists anti thought, we are not going to ask any questions about the Constitution. This is not verbatim. This is the general idea that I'm giving you. We're not going to ask questions because that'll give them op opportunities to explain what certain clauses mean. Let, you know, let's not give them that opportunity. So the Federalists had the strategy. They were like, it has been said in such and such essay. They would get, get up and uh, 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 preface it with that. And then they would talk about what the Constitution meant. I talked to one uh, scholar who said that the North Carolina Ratification Convention minutes might be one of the most even-handed accounts of the debate that occurred at the state levels. Because see, Federalists typically paid someone to take notes. And then the Federalists would uh, um, be e editors of those notes. Well, the Federalists, so sometimes it looks like erudite Federalists are, are debating bumpkin anti-Federalists, you know. Uh, but if you read the North Carolina minutes, it's pretty e even-handed. So the, there was a lighter editorial hand, if, if you will, with the North Carolina ratification. Uh, minutes. And the reason I point that out is because one, I encourage you to check it out. If you Google North Carolina ratification minutes, it'll pop up. UNC has posted it online. But also James Madison in 1796 in the halls of Congress and then in 1820 in a letter to uh, uh, the editor Thomas Ritchie, the editor of the Richmond paper, said, um, so he said this throughout his political career. So there's a consistency of thought. He's not just adapting to the current political crisis, uh, in my opinion. He said, if you want to know original intent of the U.S. Constitution, here are two things. Again, this is not verbatim. This is the general idea of what he's saying. One, read it. Read, read the Constitution. All right, read it. All right. Second thing he said, the state ratification minutes provide the key to unlocking the original intent because that's where they really fleshed out what the necessary and proper clause meant and so forth. Like in North Carolina, they were debating whether there should be religious qualifications for office. Some were for it. Some, some were, were, were against it. Some who were against it said there shouldn't be religious qualifications for office because people who really want political office will say anything to get it. <laughs> Are you a Methodist? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. But and then the other argument was like, I would rather deal with an honest person. Uh, th those debates were going on then. All right. So we have these Federalists. We have these Anti-Federalists. North Carolina refuses to reject and ratify the Constitution 1788, 1789, North Carolina. Once it's assured that there will be a Bill of Rights, James Madison, the father of the Constitution, who said the Bill of Rights is unnecessary, said that in 1787, 1788, is running for Congress in, in Virginia. There's anti-federalist concerns in his district. He makes a promise. I will support le legislation or introduce le legislation that there be a Bill of Rights added to the U.S. Constitution. Kept his promise. Wheels are in motion. North Carolinians see this, 1789 in Fayetteville, they approve the U.S. Constitution. So, are you that North Carolina, people were watching what North Carolina would do and what New York would do and Virginia and so forth, but North Carolina played an important role in securing that there be a Bill of Rights added to the U.S. Constitution. And another little rabbit trail, if you'll permit me to be pedantic for a second. Uh, all the names in downtown Raleigh or named after some something or someone in the uh, uh, planning commission for the city 
of, of, of Raleigh. Like I told you about Jones Street. Blunt Street is named after William Blunt, one of the signers of the De Declaration of Independence. Morgan Street, Edenton Street, Hillsborough Street, those types of streets, they're named after the eight judicial di districts in the state at the time. Uh, you have Hargett, uh, Blunt, Jones, all those men were on the commission. I say that, all that, to say that the uh, parking deck sits on land that was once owned by Wy Wy Wiley Jones when he was on there. So he owned that land where that parking deck sits. And you go downtown Raleigh, South Street, West Street, East Street, North Street, that was the boundaries of Raleigh at the time when uh, the city was formed. Okay, and, and thank you right. for allowing that. <coughs> Mm -hmm. And so they now learned to not mention that candidate's name, but to go after that candidate without doing that. But it sounds like they were doing exactly the same thing. Yep, there's nothing there. Like I was saying, a lot of these guys, um, yeah, uh, sometimes people have the mit misconception, like I said, that they were singing campfire songs together. But uh, there were heated political discussions and definitely disagreements about the future of America. Although I think many Federalists and Anti-Federalists uh, um, would, would, would be surprised today. Although they had political di di differences then, I think the last hundred years things have really changed. Any questions? Yes, sir. Right. Well, that is very important, and and as you point out, all that territory back in the mountains was under was in North Carolina at the time. So I, you know, the group that still commemorates the march from Western North Carolina and Western Virginia to to. Well, there are historians that say, like, Kings Mountain was the turning point. The British thought they could tap into this loyalist sentiment. And when the troops were here, uh, there was a revival of interest in it. But Kings Mountain was a sound defeat, and it also signified a patriot of resurgence as well. And Cornwallis, you're right, never really recovered. I was delivering a talk about North Carolina's role in the founding. And... Uh, <clears throat> uh, and I'm glad this statement was made because that's one of the reasons why I was giving the talk. Uh, um, a woman approached me afterward and said, I didn't know the revolution occurred down here. She's originally from Phil Philadelphia. And so, I mean, she's around uh, that. But, and even with the founding, Americans typically cite five or six founders. Uh, um, uh, and, and there are many more 
many more than that, and, and, and that can, was five or six typically only offer one. Well, no, that's not exactly right. But um, it doesn't understand the complexity of, of the formation of the United States of America. Yes, sir. Okay, thanks.